good afternoon or good evening. Welcome to this year's Undergraduate Leaders Program of the Association of Pacific Rim Universities. Today, we are reminded of light and hope, two things that we will need to triumph over this pandemic. In the Taosug language of the Philippines, these two are encapsulated in one word, which is Sahaya. I am very honored to welcome you to the very first virtual Undergraduate Leaders Program. With the theme Sahaya, science and arts, harnessing the youth's advocacies, are you willing to take the challenge to be Sahaya of the future? But first, Aimee? What does it take to be a Sahaya? Let's watch this video prepared by TVUP to get to know more. A light traversing the vastness of our universe. Our potential as a human race is represented by the multitudes of galaxies that surround us. An infinite journey towards a sustainable, inclusive, and compassionate world. We have achieved great lengths throughout history, safeguarded our democracy, from dictatorship and tyranny, explored space and jolted our quest for knowledge, advanced borderless innovation of technology to aid humanity, created limitless literature that has reached our very hearts and soul. We have made scientific breakthroughs and fortified healthcare systems in a pandemic. All that by pulses of lights banded together, by memories and aspirations for one another, to make our journey for a sustainable, inclusive, and compassionate world finite. Sahaya is the theme of the 2021 APRU ULP. It is derived from the Tausug word that means light and hope. A language spoken in Mindanao and a lingua franca in southern Philippines. It is no accident that it is cognates with the word Sahaya, which also means light, radiance, illumination in Bahasa Indonesia. Well, for me, um, I am so happy to get involved in Sahaya because of the words science and art. Basically, uh, Sahaya is not just a metaphorical rendition of what we know in Taosug language as light and hope, uh, but basically it talks about how people from across uh, the different Asia-Pacific countries, especially young people, be able to engage with each other in a very multidisciplinary, not just interdisciplinary setting. At Sahaya, undergraduate student leaders will have a platform to highlight their advocacies in line with sustainable development goals, providing the light that will direct their peers and offering the hope for the future of the institutions and nations. The workshops hope to inspire participants to reflect on ideas together with their peers and sort out problems that can inspire actions to move forward. The best part of Sahaya is translating the output into advocacy that student leaders can push in social media and various platforms. Humans have altered our world tremendously. Past designs and decisions have resulted to the various environmental and urban issues we are facing right now. Hope, however, should not disappear. And this hope is epitomized by young minds who, notwithstanding their youth and relative inexperience, acknowledge the value of genuine service and live according to this important virtue. This pandemic may have seemed to have dimmed that light and hope, but this APRO will bring together the different participants from the various universities. And so through this particular event, I'm hoping that we can somehow help mold the view, the perspective of our future leaders on how they see the world and themselves. So what I, I would like for them to see themselves is, is uh, as a problem solver someone who intends to solve various problems in this planet. This year's host, the University of the Philippines, 
has so much in store for the participants. It e aims to equip the participants to collaborate towards a uh, synergy of their various advocacies. This conference will definitely be an experience for our participants and also for our organizers to be able to share new ideas for the new times. It's very important now to emphasize the concept of no poverty, of zero hunger, of good health and well-being, well of quality education, of gender equality, of having clean water and sanitation, or having clean energy, affordable energy, and having uh, a very respectable uh, way of living, decent work, economic growth. These are things that are being challenged uh, as a result not only of the pandemic, but this, this disparity between the rich and the poor, not just in, in, in developing countries, but even in developed countries. Uh, the Sustainable Development Goals are anchors to advance human flourishing that is inclusive and equitable. The SDGs could be the starting point for different gr groups from different backgrounds to start a conversation, explore, and develop initiatives to work together. Thank you very much, TVUP, led by Executive Director Emeritus Professor Gigi Javier Alfonso for giving us an in-depth interpretation of what Sahaya is. With this, it will be much closer to our hearts. The first ever Virtual Undergraduate Leaders Program is a testament to our commitment in creating a world that is inclusive, compassionate, and sustainable. Aside from that, TVUP's video also emphasized the importance of youth that they have a big role to take in spreading light and hope, especially under the situation we are in right now. So let me take this opportunity to acknowledge our participants from the different member universities of the Association of Pacific Rim Universities. May I request for a virtual round of applause as we call on the participants. We have with us today, the University of New South Wales, Sydney, Nanjing University, Shanghai Jiao Tong University, the Chinese University of Hong Kong, the University of Hong Kong, Universidad San Francisco de Quito, Universitas Indonesia, Keio University, Osaka University, Waseda University, Korea University, University Malaya, University of Auckland, the University of the Philippines, and the Nanyang Technological University. Welcome everyone to ULP 2021. My name is Jose Wendell Capilli, Assistant Vice President for Public Affairs and Director of the University of the Philippines System uh, Media and Public Relations Office. And I am Amy Su Martinez, Assistant Vice President for Academic Affairs and Director of the Office of International Linkages. Now to formally welcome you to the University of the Philippines, it is my distinct honor to introduce the President of the University of the Philippines, Attorney Danilo L. Concepcion. Good morning to all of you. Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. I am very pleased to welcome all the participants to this year's Undergraduate Leaders Program of the Association of Pacific Rim Universities. The University of the Philippines is deeply honored to be hosting this event. Our only regret is that we are unable to host it physically, so I could have welcomed you personally on campus. But being together in the clouds is part of our world now, Virtual conferences, virtual parties, meetings through Zoom or other platforms, and right now, the first ever virtual undergraduate leaders program. Humanity has worked its way through distance and has made us closer by sending out lights and memories. I know that because of the pandemic, we have deemed lights and painful memories. Words will never be enough to fill the emptiness that has been forced upon us because of this crisis. But as a community of scholars and leaders, 
I know that we are together and we will move forward together. With the theme Sahaya, Science and Arts Harnessing Youth's Advocacies, we organize this program with APRU to bring you together so you can meet and communicate with each other as the voices and faces of your generation. The interaction you will undertake over the next 11 days will expose you to different experiences, viewpoints, and approaches, preparing you for much bigger projects that lie ahead. We have prepared a full menu of interesting and challenging topics that will engage your imagination and creativity. From discussions of digital literacy and art to food security and resilience, some of our university's foremost experts in their fields will share their insights with you. Sahaya, as I have learned, also meant light and hope in the Tausug language of the Philippines. Two very important things fused in one word. Our journey will be a difficult one. I know that everyone has lost so much, but we should never stray away from our destination towards a sustainable, inclusive, and compassionate world. Amidst the darkness and despair around us, light and hope are what we all need to find the way forward. You, our undergraduate leaders, will be the torch bearers. Lead the way and the world will march with you. I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Mabuhay. Thank you very much, President Danilo L. Concepcion, for that very warm and comprehensive speech. The workshop prepared for our APRU ULP leaders are definitely exciting. We are very fortunate to be joined today by the Secretary General of the Association of Pacific Rim Universities. Dr. Christopher Tremuan was elected as the fourth Secretary General of APRU. He has been serving as SG since June of 2011. Before heading the APRU International Secretariat, he was the Vice President and Pro Vice Chancellor of the University of Auckland, New Zealand. Dr. Tremuan has a bachelor's and master's degrees in social anthropology from the University of Auckland, a master's degree in public administration from Harvard University, and a PhD in political science on Southeast Asian politics from the University of Canterbury. A specialist in social regulation in Southeast Asia, his research has recently focused on the internationalization of higher education. Let's all welcome, all the way from New Zealand, Dr. Christopher Tremwan. Thank you so much for your kind introduction and uh, a welcome. And welcome to everyone to this first ever virtual undergraduate leaders program. I'm actually uh, based in Hong Kong, so I'm speaking to you from there, from the APRU Secretariat. And I wish to thank uh, President Concepcion for this event being hosted so creatively by the University of the Philippines in these difficult times. For those of you who may not be very familiar with its distinguished history, let me say that the University of the Philippines has long been a beacon in the region, not only for intellectual leadership, but also for advocacy by its faculty and its students for academic autonomy and human rights and democracy. So a beacon sends out light to illuminate the way ahead. It is therefore most appropriate that the University of the Philippines leads us under the theme of Sahaya, light and hope, as we act on the many overlapping challenges facing our societies. I also welcome you uh, on behalf of APIU's 60 member universities spread around the Pacific Ocean, Asia, North and South America, and Australasia. This network of leading research universities has extraordinary resources in education, research, and community outreach 
as well as partnerships with the public and private sectors and with other international organizations. We must use this knowledge and connectivity of this network to address with urgency the overlapping crises that humanity faces. And this is a core objective of APIU, which we pursue in four work streams. Shaping higher education in the Asia Pacific, creating global student leaders, and solving Asia Pacific challenges and also high level policy dialogue. And that's by uh, the way we advocate the, the first three. Now we have programs and activities focused on major themes and you can see them here, solving Asia Pacific challenges from digital economy, global health, multi-hazards, Pacific ocean and biodiversity, population aging, sustainable cities and landscapes and sustainable waste management. And all these come from the uh, objectives and strengths of our members who propose these uh, activities. And there are many things you can look at on our website, which will show you the work being done. Other opportunities include under our creating global student leaders work stream, uh, a number of recent opportunities. There are many activities, again, on our website, but these I draw your attention to. The uh, global climate change simulation, uh, global perspectives on anti-Asian racism, overcoming hate, uh, APIU virtual student exchanges, and the eSports fellowship program. And uh, we are now sending to the chat uh, the links to these opportunities for you so that you may be aware of them. So there are many opportunities and tasks that you that need you urgently and without delay to, uh, to engage. Harnessing your advocacy and your knowledge in the arts and sciences to solve critical challenges. As you know, as we meet, the world is looking towards the UN Climate Change Conference COP26 in Glasgow at the end of, starting at the end of this month. Our scientists have told us that we've already crossed many thresholds of, ir of irreversible climate change and its impacts, including worsening inequality and irreversible biodiversity loss. And we see this happening all around us. It is happening right now and more quickly than any of us anticipated. We also know that governments and companies and other bodies are not responding quickly or sufficiently to prevent increasing extreme events and widespread devastation in a world marked by sharp inequalities. There are too many powerful interests resisting change and inducing stalemate. On this and related issues, we must find the ways to break the impasse. This means building alliances of trust across borders of all kinds committing serious resources for the common good, regulating against corporate and political self-interest. And your role for the rest of your lives, as it is for mine, is to generate the political will at all levels of society to limit global warming and sustain ecosystems that support equitable societies. Universities and other institutions may have the knowledge and expertise, we do, but we also need a new generation to apply it, to generate the social consciousness and political movements that will ensure our societies not only preserve life on this planet, but make it worth living. Finally, let me just thank our colleagues and partners at the University of the Philippines, Professor Cynthia Bautista, Vice President for Academic Affairs, Professor Aimee Sue Martinez, Director, Office of International Linkages, Professor Emeritus Gigi Alfonso, Film and Mass Communications, Arlene Bibiana Boro, and Chino Riego, Office of International Linkages. Thank you to you and all the other colleagues at the University of the Philippines. We are most grateful. And I welcome all the participants again and wish you a productive and enjoyable experience of this year's undergraduate leadership program. Thank you so much and best wishes.
Thank you, Dr. Chamuan, for that wonderful message and for reminding our future leaders of this role in solving our various global issues. Inspired with this special performance, it is my honor and pride to introduce the University of the Philippines Concert Chorus under the supervision of U UP College of Music Professor Jai Sabas Aracama. You and I must make a pact. We must bring salvation back. Just call my name and I'll be there. I'll reach out.
Powerful performance, the UP Concert Chorus. Let's give them a very warm round of applause under the supervision of UP College of Music Professor Jai Sabas Arakawa. Very, very moving indeed. In line with our theme, art is truly a powerful instrument to spread light and hope. Yes, Wendell. Wow, that was truly amazing. I felt because I'm about to cry right there. And with ULP 2021, we look forward to enhancing and mobilizing each and every one of you using arts. And now to continue with our ceremony, ULP 2021 is graced by a very outstanding legislator, a true champion of our goal as a country to achieve the sustainability goals of the United Nations. Please welcome Honorable Lauren Legarda. Dr. Christopher Tremewan, APRU Secretary General, Dr. Howard Boyce, World Food Prize Laureate and Emeritus Fellow, International Food Policy Research Institute, President Danilo L. Concepcion, University of the Philippines, Dr. Maria Cynthia Rose Manzon Bautista, Vice President for Academic Affairs, University of the Philippines, Dr. Grace Gigi J. Alfonso, Local Organizing Committee of APRU ULP 2021 UP Office of International Linkages. And to our participating youth leaders for this year's Association of Pacific Rim Universities APRU Undergraduate Leaders Program 2021, good morning. I'm very glad to welcome you here and have our country host this program as we begin the period of national and local elections in the country. Every three years, our country goes through its biggest job fairs with interested parties vying for positions they will occupy for the next three or six years. They will also hire others in multiple posts immediately after that. The hiring committee remains to be the highest and the most powerful block in the land. And believe it or not, because this is what the Constitution says, it is the Filipino people. When we talk about leadership, we have to consider this notion that leadership is a heavy burden as you seek to serve the multitudes, not merely herd them. You seek not only to have them live dignified and substantive lives with the ability to dream, but to have them realize their own power to make those dreams come true. Taken downside up, the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, are merely that, the removal of the stumbling blocks to the power to dream and to reach out our people's goals. But we need to remember that this struggle to reach the peak happens within a changing context, that of a diminishing habitat and a planet in a climate emergency. Thus, as we aspire for greatness, we need to have an ever-increasing understanding that there is indeed a need for greatness in order for humanity to conquer its major challenges. For the human race to survive and thrive, our habitats, our homes have to be in order as well. As we enter this United Nations decade of ecological restoration, we are learning the hard way that humanity should bear the burden of running the planet and returning it to a state where it can provide and continue to do so. But thus far, climate champions and environmentalists are still in the fringes of the power structures of most countries. My friends, at no other stage in history have we been given 
as crystal clear an opportunity to do the impossible as we are given today. Last year's pandemic gave us a 2020 vision to see that we cannot separate how we look at our economy from what our limited ecosystems can actually support. It was unthinkable to tame an economic system to make it go on a diet, but the pandemic has forced its hand. The House of Representatives in the Philippines, to which I belong now, a traditionally conservative chamber, has issued a foremost warning that we are indeed in a climate crisis. U.S. President Joe Biden has restored U.S. accession to the Paris Agreement. The United Nations itself has begun to include contributions of nature when measuring economic prosperity and human well-being. It has adopted a landmark framework to integrate natural capital in economic reporting, no longer relying simply on GNP, gross national product, to determine economic health. The financial sector has finally begun to realize that the basis of all financial and economic dealings is still natural capital and are now accounting for what was previously considered as externalities. As the false dichotomy of economy and ecology starts to dissipate, the space now opens up for new leadership to evolve, to right economic wrongs and shift towards sustainable directions. Because as many young people believed, getting out of this crisis is no longer unthinkable. And this restoration has to be done with the abiding principle that not only must we respect and uphold the rights of young people, we must understand. Young people can think for themselves if we give them the space and the tools to do so. Leadership can be exercised with a proper assessment of what you have to work with to show how you can maximize your resources to deliver the optimum results. The problem has been that the results often not calculated the damage to the world's ecosystems. So let me again tilt the axis of these important concepts of its SDG and leadership and invite you to look at the challenges from a different lens, a different angle. All of the SDGs will fall into these concepts. First, we have to understand what it takes to be happy and how to remain so. Studies have recently been numerous on how there is an optimum level at which Material goods will make you happy, but past that, they no longer have the power to increase happiness. An acceptance of this simple notion will prevent so much accumulation that has caused inequality in our planet and hopefully reduce poverty and inequality. Second, we need to put a premium on ecology. Indigenous peoples have inherited from many generations their appreciation of the earth. But people these days hardly know the names of their great-grandfathers, much less the lessons they taught. Previous generations had a closer relationship with the ecosystems that gave them life, air, food, water. When we started to operate societies that dismissed that closeness, we began to go blind. We began to unsee the lasting damage we can cause if we keep ourselves uninvolved in the workings of our habitat. Third, we have to shun waste. We live in a planet that was created to operate in cycles and have ushered a modern society that changed that into lines. That's why I enacted in my first term the Ecological Solid Waste Management Law, RA 9003. That is why I've been filing the PENCAS Bill on Natural Resource Accounting. And that is why I keep on filing the Circular Economy Bill. And that is why I have authored at least eight environmental laws in my three terms in the Philippine Senate. Materials used to naturally cycle 
as we learned in grade school, in elementary. We started to take, make, use, and throw. But there is a limit to what we can take and a limit to what we can throw away. We need to bring the cycles back. Industry has to make the drastic shift if we are to achieve this. Fourth, we are besieged day and night by stimulus, words and images that peddle lifestyles that this planet cannot sustain. More recently, the platforms for delivery of the information have been weaponized, turning them against the users and cleverly crafting untruths that masquerade themselves as truths. The age of disinformation was always the risk when you have 24-7 access to gargantuan volumes of information. Hence, we need to sharpen our wits about us and develop critical minds to be able to tell which is true, which is untrue. Education delivers this capacity. Lastly, we have to ensure on inclusivity in terms of our policies and programs, not just of the government, but even in the private sector, academe, entire society. The trust or the test of true leadership is in the fate of the worst off in society. Social justice is part of the blueprint of any successful society. If these seem like difficult imperatives, consider the alternative, ecosystems collapsing in chains, food prices skyrocketing, disease spiraling higher, land going underwater. As difficult as they may be, when the flood waters start to rise, what we need to do is to find a raft. Our rafts are our protected areas. I was principal author of the Expanded National Integrated Protected Areas INIPAS Act that legislated nearly a hundred new sites to protect and conserve. Whether we actually succeed in the drastic changes we need or not, these protected areas will serve as the arcs that will carry us afloat. They will be the source of continuing genetic diversity that can regenerate our home, our planet. For the rest of the planet outside our protected areas, our rubrics need to consider the value of the natural capital we are losing. Thus, I also filed the Philippine Ecosystem and Natural Capital Accounting System, PENCAS Bill, HB 9181. I fail to understand why we are so thorough in our businesses and our households in accounting for every earning, every spending, but fail to account for the capital coming from nature as if it were endless or infinite. Our economic rubrics do not include the wealth from nature, nor the damage wrought against it. We seek to uplift or lift people out of poverty, but as the basis of all livelihood and economy depletes, they will be delivered right back into poverty and destitution. It is in times of crisis when the gifts and powers of the youth have an opportunity to shine. We must seek a better normal, making full use of those gifts and powers, never again allowing them to be suppressed. I thank you for this opportunity to share with you my thoughts, my passion, and yes, my vision and dreams and the work I do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Legarda, for that inspiring message and for reminding us of mankind's pursuit to happiness as key to sustainability. We really have to be proactive when it comes to defending our environment. We have to make sure that our only planet continues to thrive, to be enjoyed by many more generations. And also making sure that people at the margins get equal, if not more attention in our journey to achieve sustainable development goals. Our next speaker served as director of Harvest Plus from 2003 to 2016, 
he coordinated an interdisciplinary multi-institutional effort to develop, test, and disseminate micronutrient-rich staple food crops to reduce mineral and vitamin deficiencies among malnourished populations in developing countries. Since 1993, he has sought to promote biofortification globally. He is an alumnus of Stanford University and a former fellow at the International Rice Research Institute in, uh, near UP Los Baños. In 2016, he was awarded the World Food Prize in recognition of his accomplishments of the Harvest Plus team. Before pursuing his graduate studies, he worked for three years from 1972 to 1975 as a volunteer in the Philippines for volunteers in Asia. I am very pleased to introduce to you Dr. Howard Puiz. Thank you for this opportunity of speaking to the APRU Undergraduate Leadership Program on Ensuring Food Security Through Sustainable Production and Good Nutrition the role of biofortification and food staples in contributing to dietary quality. I made my first trip to the Philippines in 1972, serving as a volunteer for three years, right after graduating from college at Stanford University. I returned to Stanford in 1975 to earn my PhD in agricultural economics. I then spent the next 38 years based at the International Food Policy Research Institute in Washington, DC. I have been working all that time and even now in retirement in Los Banos on how agriculture can be applied to improving human nutrition in countries which have high percentage of people who live in poverty. In a sense, my presentation is an overview of what I have been working on for the past 40 years. My task then is to familiarize you with the problem of malnutrition in poor countries, its consequences and underlying causes, and my perspectives on what can be done to address malnutrition. The focus of my work has been mineral and vitamin deficiencies in poor countries. This slide shows images and messaging developed by the Philippine nutrition community the fundamental cause of widespread mineral and vitamin deficiencies is that the poor cannot afford to buy sufficient vegetables, fruits, pulses, and animal products. The result is poor dietary quality. Let me repeat that phrase, poor dietary quality. Let me emphasize that poor dietary quality is not about people going to bed hungry. There are very tragic situations where there is prolonged drought or displacement due to civil wars where people go to bed hungry, sometimes eventually leading to starvation. But these are relatively uncommon occurrences. For the most part, day in and day out, year after year, the poor can grow or buy enough of their basic food staples, say rice in Asia or corn in Africa, for their families to keep from going hungry. But that is about all they can afford to eat each day, not much else, not nearly enough of non-staple foods, such as animal products, vegetables, fruits, to stay healthy. It is the non-staple foods that are dense in minerals and vitamins that people need to stay healthy. As doctors, you will understand that good nutrition is essential input into good health. This problem of poor dietary quality is an ongoing crisis day in and day out, year after year, all across the globe in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. You do not hear about this in the news. Usually the news is about people who go to bed hungry. Let me address very briefly the consequences and magnitude of inadequate mineral and vitamin intakes. As doctors, you will understand this very well. I would rather spend most of my time talking about solutions. The three micronutrient deficiencies affecting the most people in poor countries with the most severe consequences are vitamin A, iron, and zinc. 
About 30 years ago, the international nutrition community became acutely aware of the problem of what became known as quote unquote hidden hunger after a series of high dose vitamin A supplementation trials showed that child mortality was reduced by an average of 23%. This was a number much higher than expected. Nutritionists have since determined that iron deficiencies in young children lead to impaired cognitive development. This is tragic for realizing a happy and productive life. Moreover, impaired cognitive development has a huge long-run economic cost. Mortality rates for women in childbirth are high due to iron deficiency and lowers ability to perform strenuous work. Iron deficient people tire easily. Zinc is important for the immune system and deficiencies are associated with higher levels of morbidity and death. Mineral and vitamin requirements are especially high for children and mothers for growth and reproduction respectively. Two billion, two billion children and women globally are at risk for these deficiencies. I do not have time to go into more details and statistics. This comparative picture of brain development under good and poor nourishment gives a visual intuitive sense of the terrible and somewhat hidden consequences of undernutrition. In summary, hidden hunger is a massive public health problem in poor countries, day in and day out, year after year. There is no one strategy that will solve the problem of mineral and vitamin deficiencies. A mix of strategies is required. Each has its own particular comparative advantages and drawbacks. Some can be implemented relatively quickly, which relieves current untold suffering but these tend to be more expensive. Are governments willing to maintain recurrent expenditures year after year for shorter term strategies? Agricultural strategies are lower cost, but take longer to implement. A theme that I will return to later is whether policymakers have the patience and perseverance to pursue longer term strategies that avoid the same recurrent costs year after year and are more resilient and sustainable. When the issue of mineral and vitamin deficiencies was first recognized, the nutrition community began with programs to provide supplements and food fortification, which filled the gaps but did not directly treat the underlying problem of poor dietary quality. For example, 10 billion with a B Vitamin A supplements have been given out over the past 20 years to preschool children, saving millions of lives. The cost is one to two dollars per supplement. Countries must continue to spend year after year for supplements and food fortification. For example, the Universal Vitamin A capsule program in the Philippines has been going ongoing for 28 years now. Mothers who receive vitamin A capsules as preschoolers are now bringing their own preschoolers to receive vitamin A capsules. How many more generations before the program can be discontinued? This simple stylistic diagram makes the point that it is much more cost effective and sustainable for agriculture to supply a higher percentage of minerals and vitamins that people need at affordable prices. As represented by the green shaded portion of the rectangles, which represent total mineral and vitamin requirements. Initially, the nutrition community was focused on filling the yellow gap in the diagram, not growing the green supply of nutrients from agriculture. As we look to the future, we can break down the specific activities to be undertaken within agriculture into two broad groups. First, those activities which focus on food staples, which must increase the density of minerals and vitamins. Consumers already eat maximum amounts of food staples. Second, those activities which focus on non-staple foods must seek to increase the quantities eaten. 
Fundamentally, the second strategy is only possible if incomes can be increased and food prices can be lowered. Both broad strategies need to be pursued simultaneously. Food staples are not dense in minerals and vitamins. However, the absolute intake of minerals and vitamins from food staples is a result of multiplying quantities consumed times the density. The first term in this multiplication, quantities consumed of food staples, is a high number. Thus, as this slide shows, milled rice in the Philippines provides a very significant proportion of a wide range of minerals and vitamins in diets. In fact, no single food in the Philippines provides more nutrients than rice. The objective then within the substrategy of focusing on food staples is to increase densities. Finally, we come to the term biofortification, which is in the title of my presentation. I myself have worked for more than 25 years to promote and implement a strategy of biofortification through plant breeding under a project which I helped organize and direct, which we called Harvest Plus. This picture shows a deep orange maze developed through conventional plant breeding, which is high in vitamin A. Africans eat white maize, which has no vitamin A, but vitamin A deficiency is widespread. The orange mazes are high yielding and sell for the same price as white maize. Getting Africans to substitute orange maize for white maize in their diets will go a long way toward eliminating vitamin A deficiency at no extra cost to consumers. Similar to universal commercial fortification, such as for iodized salt, it is not cost effective to target orange maize to particular socioeconomic groups. The vision is for all maize consumed to be orange. Most of the costs for development of orange maize are for plant breeding and initial scale up and acceptance of a novel color change. Carrots are the first biofortified crop of which I am aware. Carrots used to be mostly white or purple with little or no provitamin A. Through orange color selection over many decades and directed plant breeding, carrots are now a very significant source of provitamin A in diets in the United States at no extra cost to nutrition programs. Several types of biofortified crops are now released in 40 countries and are in testing for release in more than 20 additional countries. Some crops have more iron, some have more zinc, some have more vitamin A. Nearly 400 biofortified crop varieties have been released in low and middle income countries. Biofortified crops are being grown by a minimum estimate of 10 million farm households globally. Harvest Plus now is striving to make the numbers of producers and consumers of biofortified crops much higher in the hundreds of millions. Some of you may have heard of golden rice, which is a GMO rice with provitamin A. The Philippine government recently has given full permission to deregulate golden rice and allow commercial propagation. In a few years, it will be possible to combine the high iron, high zinc lines with golden rice. Transgenic biofortified rice will contain high densities of vitamin A, iron, and zinc. Rice, of course, is the most widely eaten food staple globally. Let me make a few remarks about the potential contribution of golden rice alone to vitamin A intakes in the Philippines. I show this slide again to emphasize that current varieties of rice contain no vitamin A. However, for a wide range of nutrients, the contribution of rice to total intakes in the Philippines is already quite substantial. 100 grams of milled golden rice provides approximately 100 retinol activity equivalents before cooking. 
On average, per capita consumption of milled rice in the Philippines is 300 grams per day. Thus, on any given day, the golden rice is substituted for non-biofortified white rice. 300 retinol activity equivalents are added per person to the family diets at no extra cost to families. For the lowest wealth quintile, this would represent nearly a doubling of vitamin A intakes from their present estimated level of 335 retinol activity equivalents. Rice is the perfect food vehicle for biofortification. The poor eat large quantities and are disproportionately benefited. It is important to note that there is a wealth of evidence now in the nutrition literature that increasing the density of vitamin A, iron and zinc in food staples improves micronutrient status and demonstrates even that functional outcomes are improved, such as less sickness and better cognitive and work performance. For example, an efficacy trial conducted in Maharashtra giving high iron perlmillet to school children showed an improvement in iron status and an improvement in cognitive performance. Mothers and their children who consumed high zinc weed in this nutritional study in India had fewer episodes of illness than mothers and their children who consumed the regular non-biofortified wheat. I turn now to vegetables, fruits, pulses, animal products, those foods which are already dense in minerals and vitamins. In my opinion, the fundamental strategy should be to increase the supply of specific key foods that can contribute importantly to nutrient intakes and where supply can be increased cost effectively through public policy and investments. There, there are two fundamental points to make. First, the primary objective is to lower the price of these specific foods. Second, these specific foods will vary greatly by country depending on dietary patterns. A perfect example is provided by the work of 2019 World Food Prize laureate Simon Groot. For decades, his East-West Seed Company has been expanding, developing, and disseminating hybrid vegetable seeds in Africa and Asia. Farmer productivity is increased, while more rapidly growing supplies allow for the possibility of falling prices of vegetables. A second example is a major push by the Indian government called Operation Flood which improved the efficiency of milk production. Supply went up sharply and the price went down significantly. Milk consumption increased. Investing in more efficient milk production was a nutrition smart agricultural activity. Having started my endeavor to promote biofortification at the young age of 42, and now having passed my 70th birthday, more recently, I've been reflecting on what agricultural scientists of future generations will be able to accomplish with new tools, some yet undiscovered. This is perhaps the most important point that I will make. I realize now that for biofortification to reach its full potential, it must be relatively easy and rapid to transfer multiple new traits to new varieties. As already discussed, one of the limitations of biofortification using conventional breeding has been adding single nutrients to crops. Second nutrients are added sequentially, not simultaneously. Moreover, and very importantly, climate change is putting new demands on plant breeders. My hope is that as these more powerful techniques become available and practical to use, Agricultural scientists will be even more focused than now on adding nutritional characteristics. In closing, let me read this quote, which has been a motivation for myself over many years. Such intimately related subjects as agriculture, food, nutrition, and health have become split up into innumerable rigid and self-contained little units 
each in the hands of some group of specialists. The experts soon find themselves learning more and more about less and less. The remedy is to look at the whole field covered by crop production, animal husbandry, food, nutrition, and health as one related subject and to realize that the birthright of every crop, every animal, and every human being is health. This quote sounds very contemporary, but it was written again in 1945. These ideas and concepts, broadly speaking, have been around for a long time, but it takes leadership and perseverance to put them in, into practice. Some following slides provide references for further reading. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Willis, for that highly informative yet grounding presentation. We are very fortunate to have you with us, not only in ULP, but in the country. You have contributed so much in our battle against hunger and malnutrition. We will surely continue this fight, especially now that the whole world is facing a health crisis. Always remember light and hope. Though we are miles apart, we are still connected by pulses of light and our unwavering hope. So join us as we tour around the host of this year's ULP. Welcome to the University of the Philippines. The Oblation a mark of every constituent unit of the University of the Philippines. An inculcation of our hopes and aspirations for the people. And a commitment to offer our hearts for the country. Imprinted on each student, faculty, staff, and alumni. Our testament to serve with honor and excellence. Founded on June 18, 1908, University of the Philippines has been mapped out in the archipelago to stay true to its mandate in providing quality and accessible higher education. Globally responsive, while staying grounded with the realities of the Filipino people to provide service that is comprehensive, people-centered, and based on extensive research and analysis. UP as the forefront of academic innovations and as the top university in the country maximizes all spaces for learning. The institution having survived wars and modernization proves its agility and preparedness to respond to any circumstance, situation, and environment. All 17 campuses has contributed in producing leaders, professionals, and principled citizens to help our communities and societies.
by adapting to the changing time without forgetting where we come from. In the campus on a hill, where the fog touches the ground and the wind blows in every direction, we take the path towards lifetime learning. We learn by being perceptive of our social environment, creating and recreating. We learn by conversing, listening, and speaking for others. We learn by serving, acknowledging that we are part of a larger world. For learning is not giving up. It is about being resilient. It is the constant search for answers, the transition into the best versions of ourselves, so we can serve others. We take this path towards lifetime learning. The University of the Philippines Baguio, the campus on a hill. A center of excellence, a nurturing space for innovation, creativity, and academic freedom. This is the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. As a constituent university of the University of the Philippines system, UPLB is a leading national higher education and research institution in various niche areas. Grounding itself on the needs of national development, UPLB cultivates well-rounded and critical leaders who are ready to lead breakthroughs and innovations. Through its industrial and academic partnerships, UPLB propagates its gains to advance inclusive development in various sectors. An educational institution that upholds honor, excellence, and public service. Established on February 23, 1995, the University of the Philippines Open University is the fifth constituent unit of UP that is mandated to provide quality education through open and distance e-learning. Its campus is located in Los Paños, Laguna and is easily accessible through the Los Paños National Highway. Its landmark is the UPOU seal and the art installation called the Culture of Sharing Wisdom. Since UPOU is a fully online university, the students are not required to come to the campus. Thus, compared to its sister universities, UPOU only has a number of buildings on its campus. 
the first to greet UPOU campus visitors is the UPOU Community Hub. At the entrance of the UPOU campus is the Oblation Park, where the UPOU Oblation Interactive Sculpture stands. The building right after the park is the UPOU Administration Building. At the lobby of the building is the abstract condition of the Oblation. The Teaching and Learning Hub shall soon house the three faculty offices of UPOU. The Instructional Materials Development and Printing Office Building. It also has a multipurpose function room called Oblation Hall. The UPOU Multipurpose Hall. And right next to it is the Centennial Plaza, where the Centennial Marker called the Pursuit of Education is installed. Beside the plaza is the Centennial Center for Digital Learning Building. Further down the road is the newly constructed academic residences. The following buildings are under construction. The International Convention Center, the UPOU Learning Commons, and the Multimedia Center building. This is UP Diliman, the main campus of the University of the Philippines system. With 240 undergraduate programs and 402 graduate programs, the scope and range of UP's course offerings is unmatched, covering almost all disciplines and embracing all interests and inclinations. UPD has extensive alliances with international institutions of higher learning, for joint academic programs, providing opportunities for curricular enhancement, faculty development, resource generation, and sharing of expertise. The university is also home to athletes in a variety of sports, with 24 teams in the UP Diliman Varsity Sports Program, the College of Human Kinetics is proud to house around 400 athletes who strive to give their best as they participate and bag several awards in various regional, national, and international sports competitions. Since the start of the pandemic, UP has been making a meaningful positive impact on society from distributing alcohol-based disinfectants, opening isolation zones, and a vaccination center, lending equipment for COVID-19 testing, and donating supplies for frontliners and public hospitals. This is UP Diliman. And it's not just our campus, but it's also our second home. From being a bastion of critical thinking and free speech, to a staunch advocate for social transformation and public service. 
to one institution that is known for its excellence in the field of science and engineering to the music and arts. This is Tatak QP! UP education goes beyond the borders of the university. We immerse, integrate, and take an active role in developing communities and societies, learning from one another, a bastion of principled scholars and leaders. The home of presidents, chief justices, national artists, national scientists, engineers, social scientists, lawyers, teachers, doctors, nurses, soldiers, farmers, workers, indigenous peoples, and many more. very powerful presentation. Many thanks to TVUP under Executive Director Gigi Javier Alfonso and the Media and Public Relations Offices of the different constituent units of the university. Truly, UP is our home, our safe place. UP is really beautiful. And if that was too short for you, there is a longer version available at tvup.ph. Watch out, young leaders. You might just bump into me and Wendell in the studio. We'll be discussing the Undergraduate Leaders Program for 2021 with this very short presentation. This year's APRU Undergraduate Leaders Program will be hosted by the University of the Philippines with the support of Association of Pacific Rim Universities from 18 to 29 October 2021 with the theme Sahaya, Science and Arts Harnessing the Youth's Advocacies. ULP 2021 aims to expose youth leaders of Asia Pacific to interdisciplinary, people-centered, and environmentally sustainable approaches and solutions to meet emerging challenges in the Asia Pacific in an increasingly globalized world. Participants will be engaged with 12 days of proactive and interactive sessions on creativity, innovation, and empowerment. Are you ready for the APRU ULP 2021? Day one is our opening ceremony. Day two, Workshop 1 and 2 on Digital Literacy and Critical Digital Literacy and Producing Vlogs, which will be facilitated by the College of Mass Communication, TVUP, and UP Open University. Day 3, we will have Workshop 3, Holistic Habitation, facilitated by the College of Architecture, School of Urban and Regional Planning, and College of Engineering. For Day 4, Workshop 4, Flourishing Life Through Creativity and the Arts, to be facilitated by the College of Social Work and Community Development, College of Human Kinetics, College of Arts and Letters, and UP Cebu. For Day 5, we will have Workshop 5, ensuring food security through sustainable production and good nutrition, facilitated by UP Los Baños, while for day six will be workshop six, role of biodiversity in resilient development, facilitated by the College of Science. Day seven will be the last workshop of the program entitled YOLO, 
youth opportunities to lead and overcome, which will be facilitated by the National College of Public Administration and Governance, UP Resilience Institute, and UP Manila. After the workshop, we will also have the global cultural activity to be facilitated by the Culture and the Socials Committee. For the next four days, from day 8 to 11, you will be working with your group mates to propose solutions to the emerging challenges by producing your own video blog or vlog, which will be your output for the program. Finally, the last day or day 12 will be for the presentation of your vlogs and the closing ceremony, which will also be our Philippine cultural activity. For more information and updates, please visit the program's website. We look forward to seeing all of you in the upcoming days. Thank you very much, young leaders, for participating in ULP Sahaya. To cap off this successful first day, I'm very honored to introduce to you the University of the Philippines Vice President for Academic Affairs, Dr. Maria Cynthia Rose Banzon Bautista. Pippi Sinch. Sorry. So thank you, Wendell, and good morning, everyone. So let me close uh, uh, this uh, program by thanking Dr. Tremuan, uh, former Senator Ligarda, and Dr. Buys for sharing their work and ideas to our young leaders. Let me also uh, close by reiterating our university president's warm welcome to the students from the Pacific and Latin America, from East Asia, and those from our own sub-region, Southeast Asia. A hearty welcome to and, and thank you to Professor Emeritus Gigi Alfonso, who actually orchestrated the preparations for this 12-day course, the TVUP team, and our colleagues from the different constituent universities of the UP system, who took time off from their very busy schedules to help conceptualize and plan this course, and now to implement it. Our region is faced with daunting challenges, the COVID-19 pandemic being the most palpable. Much of the world population growth in the future will arise from the Asia Pacific region. Already majority of the largest urban centers in the world are in our region. While remarkable economic growth in the last decades has resulted in moving millions of people out of poverty, the future population that will add to the size of today's generation will nevertheless continue to face intractable poverty and stark inequality. They will be confronted too by more pandemics an even more degraded environment in the wake of the reorganization of agricultural production and rapid industrialization in many parts of our region that threaten life below water and on land, and natural hazards that are projected to intensify with climate change. While it is true that many conflicts in our region have subsided and have given way to common efforts to rebuild communities torn by what then seemed to be interminable, interminable uh, animosities, much peacemaking and peace building efforts remain to be done in a region of diverse cultures and traditions, political institutions, levels of economic development, and a region that is home to contending geopolitical powers. In the disruptive future of the fourth industrial revolution made possible by extreme connectivity, extreme computing, and extreme automation, our region as well as the world we live with profound changes in the world of work and life, which we are already experiencing now, and the reality of a digital divide and a wide skills gap. What is clear from the developments in the region, recent past is that the human development issues that have confronted those living in the Asia Pacific region will not only persist, but they will become more complex, interrelated, and transnational. Addressing these problems demand effective leaders who are able to collaborate, bridge networks, and leverage collective effort to develop practicable and scalable solutions, as well as build an international community. In search of solutions, it is imperative to not, not only to link Asia-based leaders who have made a dent, uh, on, a dent on the human problems in Asia-Pacific, but 
also to build future leaders from among the young people in the region. We deeply appreciate uh, Chris Tremowan for shepherding up Bruce's multi-level, proactive, and collective response to the challenges facing Asia Pacific. APRU's undergraduate leaders program is one means of linking the next generation of the region's leaders to each other and exposing them to some of these challenges. Addressing the complex issues facing the Asia Pacific region and humanity require ethical transformational leaders with an inclusive and interdisciplinary perspective, a predilection to serve, to find concrete solutions and mobilize their respective constituencies in the future to act. Helping young leaders achieve their potential as transformative leaders entail immersing them in issues captured by the social development goals, as well as the issue of inequality that is not as salient in the SDGs, issues that are nuanced by the context, by different contexts and perspectives. Apart from immersion, it also entails providing tools in a digital world that will further harness their advocacies, as well as help them battle the world of fake news and alternative realities. Against this backdrop, ULP 2021, or Sahaya, will immerse youth leaders in the challenges of a developing society in the Asia Pacific through a 12-day program of virtual lectures and workshops with proactive and interactive sessions on creativity, innovation, and empowerment, together with local and international experts from the fields of science and the arts. Through ULP 2021, we are hoping that the youth leaders who are here virtually for the next 12 days will be exposed to a multifaceted perspective on achieving social development as uh, sustainable development goals in the Asia Pacific region and be equipped with the necessary knowledge and skills to produce video blogs and the critical digital literacy of engaged thinkers and creators in digital environments. As an output of the program, I think uh, uh, Professor Emeritus Gigi already mentioned this, you will be producing, uh, you will be proposing solutions to these emerging challenges by producing your own video blog. We have a packed program for you, a mix of interactive activities, lectures, the skill building workshops, I wish you an engaging and fun-filled course. I wish you will interact with each other. And I wish that we will begin to be friends even after this workshop and after this uh, Sahaya program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, UP Vice President for Academic Affairs, Sinha Dos Vanson Malsista for that wonderful speech. Uh, before we formally close our opening ceremonies, I would like to formally present certificates uh, of appreciation to our speakers. Uh, first, certificate of appreciation to Dr. Christopher Tremwan, Secretary General of the Association of Pacific Rim Universities. Next, certificate of appreciation to Honorable Lauren Legarda, Deputy Speaker, Philippine House of Representatives. Next, we also award the certificate of appreciation to Dr. Howard Bowes, founder and former director, Harvest Plus, 2016 World Food Prize Laureate. And certainly not the least, we present this certificate of appreciation to our very dear Dr. Maria Cynthia Rose Banson Mautista, Vice President for Academic Affairs of the University of the Philippines. Thank you very much again for all your wonderful contributions to, to ensure that our opening ceremonies will be a resounding success. Aimee? May we now request everyone to open your cameras and pose with your widest smiles. Okay, good morning. I'm China. I will be taking the group photo for everyone. So kindly open and look at your cameras. I have two pages here, so please bear with me. All right, I'll take the first photo. Kindly smile. One, two, three. Okay, hold on. All right, I'll be taking the next photo. So kindly open and look at your camera once again. One, two, three, smile. All right, thank you so much. Thank you very much, TVUP, for your technical assistance. I am looking forward to seeing all of you tomorrow, day two of our APRO ULP on digital literacy. 
critical digital literacy and producing blood. This is so exciting. Again, thank you everyone for attending our opening ceremony. Thank you very much TVP and the APRU ULP Local Organizing Committee for your hard work throughout the preparations. To our future leaders, see you all again tomorrow for day two of Sahaya. Stay safe and stay healthy. Peace out, bye.